Okay, <clears throat> and let's talk about topics to talk about today. Uh, Kate has one. Yeah, so we released a uh, version 0 0.5 of CES. Uh, so there's a few changes there that we could talk about. Okay, and uh, last time we met, um, uh, Michael Fig um, uh, uh, presented a uh, rewrite uh, that was specific to Jesse for rewriting uh, ECMAScript modules into evaluable scripts and packaging them together uh, that was um, a much more uh, original text and original scoping preserving rewrite, a rewrite that was much more clearly not introducing accidental semantic changes. Uh, and it got me thinking about doing the same uh, for a full SES um, uh, with some restrictions that I, I did want to, uh, to talk about. I hope to actually have, thing, have something to present on that by today, but I do not. And uh, other topics, anyone? So okay. You are an original textualist? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. The, the, um, uh, not, not the original intent, but the original public meaning. Now, uh, different set of distinctions. But um, uh, just, uh, just to say a little bit more, one, uh, at Agoric, we've been testing our code um, against a whole variety of different existing packagers, uh, which actually relates to some of the things that Kate will be uh, 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 announcing today with regard to the new CES release. Uh, but one of the things that we've consistently found is that every one of the existing packagers uh, introduces breaking semantic changes. Uh, and in order for security work, we need confidence that what is executing uh, preserves the semantics of the code that the programmer originally wrote, or at least if it deviates from it, deviates from it in ways that the pro that, that um, do not make things unsafe. Um, and what, what did you mean by introduces breaking changes? Uh, so well, and it, there, are, there are too many unbound pronouns, basically. Yep, 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 yep. Um, uh, I'll just give one example that uh, actually, you want, Kate, you want to give your zero comma eval example? Oh, sure. So, um, I guess this really isn't a bundler example, but it's a, um, it's a rewriter. It, it? Yeah, it's a rewriter. Uh, so ESM um, is a package, right, that allows you to, uh, to use um, ES6 style modules in Node. And uh, in the way that we are using it, we stringify, we'll, we'll have a function that gets stringified at a certain point. And if that function within it has uh, something like, you know, zero, zero comma eval, um, eval gets rewritten with some kind of junk uh, variable name, like, you know, underscore 436 or something like that. And then at some later point, I assume ESM, you know, is able to do something with that or uses that somehow. But at the point that we're kind of fossilizing it and stringifying it, uh, we just get this junk variable in the place of uh, eval. And of course, it, it's a reference error. Yeah, so the, generally the packagers assume that they can uh, do a coordinated renaming of variable uh, uh, name definitions and variable name usages under sort of the normal uh, lambda calculus alpha renaming style assumptions. And um, uh, that's not semantics preserving in JavaScript. Um, because eval is a special form? Uh, it, well, no, it's actually not because eval is a special form in this case, although it wouldn't surprise me if that was also a problem. Uh, the, the case in which uh, this occurred was uh, where we're using eval to do an indirect eval, which, uh, where we specifically avoid the special form. Um, um, the exact issue that has a sample program that reproduces it. Um, just to get concrete about what's actually going on. 
So um, um, I could actually, um, like I've, I've, I've actually explored uh, this in kind of a different light. Uh, so I, I had uh, problems with what bundlers did to modules uh, early on when I wanted to test um, native ESM. Um, I discovered that all these bundlers were basically um, doing things that nobody knew were happening and uh, you learn to actually avoid them because they tell you you should never do that because the spec says and you know that so so you learn habits to get the bundlers happy thinking you're doing the right thing uh, and eventually the specs don't necessarily don't necessarily implement uh, what people learn as better practices to get the bundlers happy um, and um, so I, I explored two two approaches to bundling um, one was to shim a module scope um, so that I'm evaluating the code um, that is, you know, using the exact names as everything that it was, only it is no longer an ESM module. It is um, um, kind of like, um, like the realm scope, but it but mimics the module's uh, scope behavior. Uh, the, uh, are, you, are, you, are you doing this by an automated rewrite or, or are you doing this by hand? Uh, well, the rewrite uh, transforms my module into a function uh, that um, that basically uses an escape approach to define the import and export statements because obviously they're not top level anymore. Um, but the module, so this is a simulated runtime module. It's it's it tries to behave like ESM modules. Obviously, I didn't think of all the edge you know edge cases. Um, but I was just trying to avoid writing the code as a function and instrumenting it to behave like a module. I was rather doing a runtime um, um, realm-like uh, approach for a module scope, like the way you would do the uh, realms. But I was basically simulating a module scope and doing all the bindings um, um, functionally. Is there, is there an example you can point at? Yeah, so uh, that's my experiment. It's um, I, I showed it before. It's it's hardly uh, descriptive. Um, let me uh, share my screen. Um, so so I'm actually still stuck, probably two steps behind that. Um, so the the issue is that there are these various bundlers, which are presumably almost but not quite semantics preserving. That's right. And, that's, and it's semantics. Preserving under some assumptions that the code avoids edge cases, uh, which are therefore assumptions that um, are broken by code that is using more obscure parts of the language in order to accomplish things. Right, and presumably each of the bundlers that are in widespread use has a slightly different set of weird edge cases that you have to be careful about. Right, and not only that, but I think in all cases we have not found any documentation about what those edge cases are. I wouldn't be surprised if in some cases um, the authors of the bundlers may not even be aware um, or, um, you know, they assume that things work a particular way when they don't. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, um, it's actually, they, they say it works as expected when you file an issue. <laughs> so. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's the line I usually get when I stop using something. You know, like when I file an issue and it's like works as expected. No, it doesn't, because I'm filing an issue. <laughs> <laughs> works as yeah. expected, right? Yeah, and then and then the second best is like, well, it's out of scope. What do you mean out of scope? <laughs> You're well, bundling I mean, out of script. Wrong. I mean, I mean, to be fair, any project has to be able to to classify some surprising bugs like that because. Uh, but the documentation of the project should, in general, grow over time so that it's explicit about what is out of scope. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could say, yes, that, that would be a problem, um, but we're not prepared to do something about that problem right now, um, um, as opposed to, I mean, that, that's just a, a general issue with lots of, I want to say, institutional processes, but organizations where, where, um, you know, where it just simply acknowledging the problem, even though you're not going to do something about it, um, could be clarifying, but 
for various defensive reasons, they don't want to acknowledge the problem either. Yeah, I think that really hits the nail. Um, acknowledging the problem and telling me they cannot do anything about it, but it's a problem would have helped uh, maybe keep me on. Uh, but many times they just say that, no, it's not a problem. Uh, and then they give you like, like the weirdest, um, you know, things that don't really help. Um, um. Um, so, so this is um, uh, this is the half of my uh, experiment that focused about uh, using a, a proxy to shim the module scope, um, and basically um, the missing part here was the rewrite of the imports and exports. Uh, that was the that was out of scope. Uh, that was the scope of another thing I'm still working on. Um, but but for experimental purposes, and if I can scroll, yeah, um, I'm basically giving a pre-function wrapped, um, um, you know, um, representation of what my module would look like. And just because I didn't want to do a lot of work that is out of scope, I uh, I use template strings to define the imports and export statements because obviously if they're in a function, they would not even reach. A point where I can work with them, you know, it's going to be. This is trying to. to this is. Uh, I, I'm missing some context. Are we looking at the code doing the translation, or are we looking at code that is being translated, or? or... No, that's that's just a demo that uses my uh, engine that would that would shim the modules, assuming that at some point um, I rewrote the modules in the format it accepts. So that's kind of like my specs or my tests. Um, and I use, I use a module constructor, give it a module name, and basically a, a proxy of what the module would have done. Um, and then it, 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 just, well, sorry, when you say a proxy, do you mean an ECMAScript proxy? No, uh, like, uh, like um, um, since I did not have the rewriter ready, I, I wrapped it in a function the way, you know, as if, as if I've ran the rewriter on it first. The okay. so, so, so let me just, or just, the code that we're looking at in the top left pane is a handwritten example of what we intend to be the output of the rewriter. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Um, on the right hand, it might be easier to explain that um, because it will compare. Um, if my module had exactly that body over here, OK, there are no imports and exports here in this module. There is a global call test that is somehow a valid thing today. Uh, and I just need to you know, do some sanity check. And basically, it will rewrite the bindings, import and export statements, preserving all variable and uh, function and, and uh, you know, all, all declarations retain their original syntax, um, uh, except the only thing I did not think about in this recipe is the dynamic imports, obviously. Um, okay. So my, my job here was to shim uh, modules um, a, in such a way that they can execute um, um, with bindings based on the static declarations without them being actually a part of the scope that is evaluated for the module. Um, so I strip them out, bind them to the scope, and execute the module code as is, removing the word export whenever it happens. That's all. Okay, so the, the code in the pane that has the highlight um, uh, you know, that you've selected yeah. uh, is the blue text intended to be the actual textual contents of oh. ECMAScript module that um, is being, that would be preserved uh, you know, would be preserved exactly by the rewrite. The rewrite would contain exactly the same highlighted string. Yeah, so this code in blue becomes this new code in blue. Uh, and obviously, since there Can you are... you highlight what the differences are? Because I can't immediately spot them. Here, there are zero differences. That's my uh, canary kind of test. That okay. tests everything except for the bindings. Uh, so it tests the global scope really, and it tests if you get the right errors uh, when you try to refer to things as if it was a module 
scope. So if I get the right behavior of the code as if it was in a module before I import and export, that tells me that my wiring uh, before bindings um, is faithful. It's obviously not 100% faithful, but it was just me taking a step in exploring it. So, you know, that was uh, accomplished as far as I can, um, you know, get to that level of the experiment. Um, and after compiling, it evaluates. And, you know, I, I wrote this test function that I have in my global scope so that I can, you know, get the output uh, nicely aligned um, in, in a transcript that I can verify, you know, when I stray um, where problems occur and everything. Um, and, and you would get the behaviors you would expect. If you have something referring to an undefined variable in a module scope, uh, it is not defined. Uh, if you assign to it, you would get something along the line that it's not defined. Um, it differs from each one. Um, type of undefined is undefined. Uh, all this does not ever define undefined variable in the global well, code. How, uh, what, you're, what you're showing there is something that we've, we have not been able to figure out how to do. How did you succeed at getting just a usage of it to give you a reference error, but having a type of, of it give you back presumably the string undefined? Yeah. So rather than giving you a reference error. So since my, my uh, proxy, I, I can, I don't know if I'm going to stay focused when I do this. I'll try to stay focused. Um, but I can get to the code that, um, again, needs a lot of rewrite. It's alpha experimental. Okay. Okay. So um, I think my scope is this one here. Uh, and and there's a, an obvious... Um, um, you know, change in, in course when I started writing this and what it became afterwards. But what I do is I get something called the global scope that uh, I wrote right before global this became um, possible. Um, and once I get my global scope, um, I uh, basically have here a um, something that takes the global scope and it, it uh, kind of creates a secondary scope with allowing me to make certain changes to some of the global variables or insert new ones or whatever. Once I have my globals, um, I set the prototype of my globals to the actual global scope. So my proxy is um, the globals um, and uh, the prototype of which is the actual global scope. Um, I do some uh, function uh, um, handling to trap um, uh, the, the, this reference to the actual global uh, in my getter. So if it's a function, I keep a local proxy to the function unless it changes and then I make a new one, making sure that if the proxy is called on what would be the global scope, it does not call it on the proxy, but it calls it on the actual global scope. Okay, let, let me make sure I'm understanding. This is the proxy. I see that the, this proxy has an explicit uh, get trap. Um, yeah. This is, and a set trap. Uh, yeah. This is the proxy that you then somewhere else do a with on. Uh, yeah. And the code we were looking at evaluates somehow within that with. Exactly. Okay. So let's, let's just take, let's, let's talk specifically through what the get trap does in the two examples that I'm curious about, one where you have just an undefined variable name and the second of which where you have type of the same undefined variable name. Okay, so let me first just say the set trap because it's easy and we'll, we'll, we'll get to the get trap. The, the set uh, basically says that um, if the receiver is not the module scope, then you should never, uh, so nothing escapes to the global. I, you know, I might have changed my strategy a bit but otherwise, it sets. What is uh, set not equal operator? Oh, that, that's that's a ligature. This is what you see is not what you get. Uh, what you get is literally this uh, without spaces or like yeah. So if I do this, you get you know, an illusion of a cool uh, not equals to. 
Okay. This is all just font based, you know, typography. Um, it's very cool. Yeah. So ligatures has been the thing, you know, uh, I think last year was like the year it, uh, it became, you know, mainstream because of uh, Chrome and VS Code. I think that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the getter now, now that's, that's the interesting part, um, up to here, because we're not dealing with functions yet. Right. Um, so undefined is not defined in the scope. Um, and the getter will do the following. If okay. it's in my globals, return it from my globals without escaping to the, um, you know, pair, the, the prototype of the globals, which is the global. Okay. Um, and then I get the value. If the value is in the global scope, because I, I didn't return, so I'm continuing, uh, then I, all I need is to check the global scope because otherwise it wouldn't exist. Okay. Uh, and then ty type of property uh, is a string, then we get it. If it's not a string, then you're doing something that you shouldn't. Uh, not, the width is not how you're getting to this. Um, so I just return undefined because there is no uh, access to symbols uh, without um, um, adding the name, you know, and without right. them, you know. Symbol, symbol cannot be the name of a variable. It cannot be identifier uh, called as an identifier. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so, so, so value would be undefined in that case. So where does the reference error come from? Um, I think it comes with how I do my evaluator. Again, you know, I've revised this over and over again. So don't quote me on any of this. Um, so I I have an eval here. Yeah, so I have a generator, and inside the generator, I have a, a strict function. And if my getter um, returns on the, oh, uh, and there's no, give me one second. Yeah, I don't understand. So if, the getter, if the getter returns undefined, then, the val then, then uh, uh, what the, uh, from the width, the behavior should be that the value of the variable is undefined. Well, we are I, seeing that behavior for the type of case, but we're not I, seeing that behavior for the other case. I don't have a has trap. And I think adding the has trap is, um, uh, you know, like, um, um, it, it's, I've played around with the has trap and it always returned false and I didn't want that behavior. So let me look somewhere else if I'm not getting the right code that would present this behavior because no, this is not the one. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll have to um, untangle a lot of um, things here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, no worries. Maybe it, um, this might be a good time to kind of do a check-in and see if we've gone too far in depth. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, so also, uh, Michael Fig has joined us. Um, uh, Michael, there are two topics that um, uh, we uh, suggested to talk about. Uh, one is uh, Kate talking about the new 0.5 release, which we have not yet done. Uh, and the other one was, um, I was very inspired by your presentation of a uh, rewrite for, for Jesse from uh, ECMAScript modules to evaluable scripts and packageable evaluable scripts. Uh, so I've been thinking about um, how to expand on that or do something like that uh, for full SES. Uh, I had hoped to have something to prepare but haven't gotten there. Uh, and it was um, from that second observation that we uh, uh, dove into examining the uh, rewriting and packaging uh, that Sala has been working on. Okay. Okay. So why don't we uh, take this opportunity to switch to um, uh, Kate's? Okay. Um, 
So yeah, we, uh, last week we released uh, SAS 0 0.5, um, and the primary takeaway is that there were a number of obstacles that were stopping people from actually using SAS in normal JavaScript development. So if you have um, bundlers as part of your normal workflow, uh, SAS just wasn't working for various reasons. Um, one of those reasons had to do with um, realms. So there was a fix that was put into realms that um, uh, specific, there was a, not to go, I won't go too far into depth on this, but there was a, a check to see whether it was in the browser or whether it was in Node. And uh, the specific case of a bundler that may shim some of these things was, was uh, breaking that logic. Uh, so there was a fix put into Realms, um, which is now integrated into the SAS release. Um, we also added, uh, I also added integration tests so that, um, that uh, from the SAS end, um, it's bundling uh, SES plus whatever, uh, it, in our case, it, it actually bundles the test code that's associated with SES and executes that in a browser um, uh, to test all of the main bundlers. So like uh, Browserify, um, uh, Parcel, uh, uh, Rollup, uh, what am I forgetting, um, Webpack. Um, so to ensure that um, none of those have strange behavior that isn't working with SES. So this is now part of our continuous integration process. So every time that we put out, that we actually make a change to SES, it goes through these tests. Um, and the tests have allowed us to uh, check, like right now the tests only run in Chrome, so we don't have full uh, coverage over all the different browsers, but um, it has, allowed us to catch that uh, Chrome had a symbol match all um, addition that needed to be whitelisted in order for uh, all of our tests to actually pass in Chrome. Fantastic. You've just enumerated all the, all the cases that stopped me from using SES in the browser. <laughs> well, that's, that's wonderful. Who, who was speaking? Sorry. Yeah, this is Michael. Oh, okay. Cool. cool. That is wonderful. I didn't get around to bug reports because I had other stuff to work on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, uh, you know, if you um, if you want to try it out and then let us know if you know it just so happens that any of the issues that were a problem are still a problem, please let us know. Um, but I think this should have covered most of those things. Yeah, match all and parcel were the ones. Okay. 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 Uh, so one of the things that um, uh, has been revealing about working with all these bundlers is all of the bundlers uh, introduce subtle semantic changes or semantic changes on edge conditions uh, uh, that have bit us in each one in different ways uh, and that in I think in all cases were not documented uh, as things to avoid. Um, uh, so uh, the reason I'm so interested in um, uh, coming up with our own very, very simple, uh, minimally invasive uh, rewriter and bundler uh, is to be much more confident that it is semantics preserving. I think if you could just figure out a pattern for semantics preserving something like bundling, you could probably get a lot of the bundlers to adopt it. If you could just I think a lot of the problems that have been flagged are problems because, well, as I said before, they may not even be aware of it, but also um, it's easy to ignore problems that you don't know what to do about them anyway. So we right, have and, been filing bugs. Yeah, um, I, I will say, I think their, um, their purpose is very different than the usage that we're actually trying to do. Uh, things like we're stringifying things, you know, halfway, <laughs> halfway through, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, like the ESM process and things like that. So, uh, what do you mean by halfway through? Well, like, uh, I presume it, it's really imprecise, but also I'm not quite sure exactly what like ESM is doing. So it, I'm kind of being imprecise on purpose, but like, uh, you know, the fact that they, uh, uh, rewrite the eval portion to be something else. I don't really know why they're doing that, but by the time that you actually, um, by the time that we stringify it, we're in the middle of a process that 
obviously they assume will continue and we're kind of uh our the our use of eval and stringification is probably like in the less than one percent of the use cases that most of these bundlers are trying to deal with so i think um I can't remember the one that was saying that if we were able to provide something to these bundlers, they may be open to using it. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think that could be the case as long as we say, you know, we have this weird use case, here's our solution to it. If you just adopt this for our, you know, as an option or something for our weird use case, uh, it won't harm the rest of your stuff, but it'll allow us to do what we want. Yeah, I mean, the thing, the thing is, is I think, um, I would think I would think the bundlers in general would want to be semantics preserving. Um, it's a much higher bar than what they need, though. Like it might be very difficult to ensure that. I mean, I mean, this, this, yeah, this goes, yeah, the whole concept of, I don't know how to solve that problem, um, and and therefore I'm not even going to try. Um, is a is a pretty common failure mode um, in a lot of organizations, and um, you know, and it's and it's a successful strategy for a lot of people because um, if they just ignore the problem that they don't know how to don't know how to deal with, and just bet that in their case the problem won't actually come up, that that's often a pretty good bet. Um, mm -hmm. and I I think there's might be some of that going on here. Right. So, um, so I'm perfectly happy once we have a scheme that we like uh, to show it to them and to encourage them to adopt it. Uh, but um, I also, you know, wouldn't bet the farm on them adopting it. Oh no, 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 no! I'm just, I'm just saying um, to the extent that they take um, um, incompatibility seriously, if you can present them the solution along with presenting them with the problem. Um, I think it'll be a lot easier. Okay. Right. I, th I think one of the philosophical differences that um, uh, is that they are trying to produce a, um, they're trying to take the opportunity to bundle to also uh, reduce runtime costs. Uh, so they want to be doing ah. scope analysis statically. Right. The price of doing that is um, uh, doing, you know, manipulation of variable names in order to uh, create less scopes and to do more static linkage as opposed to dynamic linkage. Uh, for us, um, the uh, uh, that difference in efficiency makes no, you know, makes little difference for our purposes, uh, and the semantics preservation is much much higher priority. Right, uh, and so Michael Figg's uh, rewrite was very much along the lines lines of AMD, uh, the asynchronous module definition, uh, that basically does all intramodule linkage uh, at runtime. There, there is actually a secondary thing um, uh, just just before we uh, stray about the runtime um, thing. Uh, sorry, um, what they try to preserve is um, is um, um, the uh, errors. Um, so troubleshooting wise, they want their end users to get errors that make sense to them. So they instrument code to try to give them the right, um, the right uh, traces. Okay, um, that, that, that seems like a, a laudable goal. Yeah, yeah, well, true, but then you usually get an error that does not meet their, um, you know, uh, crystal ball, um, and you're left, um, you know, unable to really know what happens until you actually figure out how their bundler works. Um, by, by, you know, by, by breaking things so much to try to give you a coherent error message, um, you oftentimes um, have a serious error when it doesn't fit that... Um, a predictive strategy. Yeah. So sorry about that. Okay. Um, so um, uh, Sally, just uh, going back to what you were just showing us, I do have, I think, one high-level question. Um, uh, 
you're because you don't have you said you don't have a has trap, um, and therefore you're getting the default has behavior. Um, the default has behavior would be that uh, if it's not defined on your with object, you know, the object you're doing the with on, i.e., the proxy, if it's not defined there, then your has then the default has trap will return false. Uh, now, are you testing in a node environment? What, what is the environment in which you're running these tests? Yeah, I run it in Safari. I run it in Node. Oh. I run it in Chrome. I run it in Firefox. OK. What is the, um, in, in order for us to do a, uh, a, a test of a hypothesis right now, what is the easiest way for you to rerun, browser or Node? Um, no, I can I can run it in Chrome. Like I refresh uh, the page. Okay, okay, good. Um, so, do a uh, try to dereference the name document. Okay, so do you want me to share the screen or not? Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay, uh, I actually do that uh, in object. Um, by dereference, you mean that. Um, just you, you use it as a, as a variable name, just like we're using an undefined variable. Well, I, what I do with object, not document, and, and I know I'm playing it uh, close to the best, but it, it exists in, um, I say object, and then I set it to undefined, um, and I expect it to be undefined, um, and then I set it back to object, um, and it gives me a reference error, object is not defined, um, and I think that has to do with assigning to it um, a behavior that I thought I fixed at some point. So let's see. Well, let, I, 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 I really want it to be not an ECMAScript thing, but a host power. So could you just try dereferencing document and see what happens? So by dereference, can you give me an example? I'll show you the just, code. Just, and the, code and the code you were showing us, um, uh, what would I do in this statement? OK, so in, in line, um, no, no, go up to line 42. OK. OK, so the way you say uh, just test, blah, arrow, an undefined variable, mm -hmm. just duplicate, duplicate line 42 and replace an undefined variable with document. OK, now I want to see what happens. All right. There we go. OK, so uh, so so uh, if I, I so I'm not sure. Can you expand that again? It's the body of the document. OK, so in other words, uh, the width on the proxy did not prevent the code uh, inside the width from referencing host objects that you were trying to deny access to? I did not try to deny document, but if you want me to try to deny document in the scope. Um, I don't want you to try to deny it by enumerating it. I want you to try to deny uh, everything that you're not allowing. Well, in my scope, everything global is allowed because it's a module scope. Uh, so I, was, I wasn't securing the module scope. I was trying to emulate the behavior okay. of the module scope. But okay. Let's suppose I take out document uh, from, from uh, my global scope. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, oh, I see, I see. You were not, this was not, try, this was trying to, okay. Um, I don't know what will happen if I say it's You were trying to create a new scope under whatever the global scope was. You were not trying to replace the global scope. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, that was the initial um, uh, step here. So the idea was just uh, replicating, um, uh, avoiding the, the pitfalls of bundling, mangling semantics by using, uh, like you said, AMD does a runtime wiring of modules. So I was doing a runtime shimming of the original module. Um, and since I'm shimming it, I, I could actually run ES code, ESM code on a platform that doesn't even support it. Uh, that, you know, those were the um, directions of my, of my experiment. Um, so here, I, I tried that test when I said if document is 
maybe I'm actually not getting an up-to-date module here because document. Yeah, so it seems that it escapes my scope unless I'm actually running code that is not behaving um, as expected. Uh, you know what? I, I, I can't trust um, the changes I did to the module itself here. So let's, let's not get, get too deep into experimenting uh, live and distracting out of the original topic. Okay, but th this explains, uh, th th so the thing that I was puzzled by I now understand, uh, which is uh, how it is you were able to get both correct reference error behavior and correct type of behavior. Uh, it's that the, is that you're not trying to prevent the scope lookup from proceeding past the width. Yeah. Okay. Like, uh, yeah, everything that is in scope is in the width scope. That, that's a good way to, to put it, yeah. And, and I'm doing very minimal um, um, proxy. Um, if I no, just... Wait, 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 I'm sorry. The, the everything that's in scope is not within the width scope. The width scope does not contain document, but document is in scope. It's in scope, uh, as in my, my false prototypical scope against globe. Like I have a global that inherits from the global scope, um, and and as such, a proxy of that will walk the prototype chain um, directly to the global. That's that's what I was uh, trying to say. So here, even when I say return false for document, uh, it's it's moving to the global scope and getting document from there because the proxy is saying it doesn't have it. Um, and uh, it doesn't even hit the get uh, trap for it. So that's what's been happening, really. Okay, I, I, I think I understand. So let, let's return back up. Um, so, uh, so uh, Michael's uh, rewrite um, uh, was uh, very AMD-like. Um, uh, and it, and uh, it was basically, uh, uh, let's see, Michael, could you project it again? Uh, sure, just let me pull it up. Okay. I should have been pointing this up while I was thinking of it. Um, trying to remember where I found it. Oh, yes. Okay. Is there trouble uh, starting to share on your end? No, I'm just trying to find where I have this. Oh, it was in my test. Right. Now I remember. Um, let's see. Here we go. Okay. Uh, now I'll share. Okay, this is it. No, that's not the right place. This should be it. Yes, can you see that? It's yeah. So this is the output of the rewrite. Yeah. So the output is above, and the the actual code that I rewrote is down here in the transit file. Okay. So it rewrites the whole module into an H define, which is 
almost directly parallel to an A and D define. And then the arguments are the list of modules it imports, followed by a factory function that takes those imports as arguments. Right, so, um, so for each of the modules that it imports, the successive arguments would be the, um, uh, the exports object of that module? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, uh, uh, speaking of which, uh, there was a question that came up, which now becomes crucial, which is uh, how does the exports object, um, how does, what's the ECMAScript module semantics of the default export versus the reified exports object? Um, Okay, so I tested with node experimental modules. Okay. And in that environment, at least, the default export is available as the default name within the exports object. The name default. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that's everywhere, by the way. Um, like I've been, I've been using uh, ECMAScript modules everywhere. Um, um, they, uh, the default exports as the default because it's the only identifier name that will ever be default from any module scope. I see. And because default is a keyword, we know that it cannot overlap with any lexical variable. Exactly. So they don't run into that problem of, of coming up with a thing that it's too clever. Okay. Okay, uh, that, that, that works and is much simpler than I was fearing. Yeah. Um, so when you do a import star as blah, the blah actually has a, a default property? Yes, and it's the default value at the time the evaluation of the module occurs. For ECMAScript modules, there's no at the time, right? No, for default, there is. Default only becomes populated as, as an expression that, um, you know, an assignment expression, uh, whereas all the others are bindings. Oh, default is not a live binding? Nope. It's, a, it's an assignment expression. It, it, theoretically, on the namespace object, it, it behaves like a binding, but you can never have a circular reference to a default because it, once it evaluates, um, it becomes whatever the value it becomes as an assignment. Okay. Uh, Michael, do you have a way to deal with uh, any cyclic imports in your rewrite? Um, yeah, that's all handled by hdefine. And basically, the implementation that I used, um, I should be able to bring that up too. I called it rewrite something or other. Rewrite define now. Um, I basically took, oh, this is the rewrite, okay. I'm sorry, I'm a bit lost in my code because I haven't been on this for a couple days. Um, I have a define, I think. Where's my define? I think I defined it in the index directly. Yeah, I did. Okay. Okay. Um, so I basically have the imports and then the factory function are the arguments. Okay. Uh, for the imp for all the imports, I um, map them to the module and then the index of the module. I create a promise in the loading map if it doesn't exist. And then if it does exist, I just return the promise. Otherwise, the promise does the fetch and the load. This is within the browser right now. So 
uh, as soon as we list our imports, that all results in a list of promises. There is no explicit handling of cyclical references. Uh, there probably has to be. Um, uh, it's a very, very uh, tricky thing to yeah. accommodate um, cyclical references with this pattern. Uh, I, you know, this is the only pattern that people use, by the way. Um, without bindings, uh, you don't get uh, cyclical uh, behavior. Um, and uh, that, that's basically the, the only issue that stands in, in, in allowing CommonJS to have first class interaction with ESM. Okay. So in my case, it's not so bad because I'm not actually trying to emulate ESM specifically. I'm just trying to get Jesse modules to work. Okay, but, but Jesse modules are uh, within, still within a subset of uh, ESM. Yes, true. And they have to, the, 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 that subset has to, um, uh, uh, has to still stay within full ESM semantics. Uh, does the subset itself prohibit cyclic imports? Uh, the, the question at hand, and that I've not resolved yet, is does the subset allow main bindings? And if it doesn't, if it only allows defaults, then this pattern is fine. Okay. Right. If it only allows defaults, then the pattern is fine. And uh, it's fine because when only using defaults, you can't do cyclic imports. Um, th there is just the concern of uh, causality here. Um, just because uh, defaults don't um, uh, result in binding-like behavior that can potentially have cyclical um, references, uh, it, it is not the cause of the problem with cyclical references here. The problem with cyclical references here is um, crossing the sync async boundary. By having a promise in the middle of that chain, um, you're basically deferring um, a synchronous code from continuing until the promise resolves. And if the cyclical reference occurs because of the promise, then it cannot refer to the result of the promise until the promise resolves. Uh, which is correct, yes. That, that's. This is saying that all the imports have to resolve before we can evaluate the code in the module. Right, and, and because Jesse modules are pure, um, you can get away with that and still say it's a subset of the ESM semantics, whereas for full SES, because we have resource modules that can be stateful and which are sensitive to order of execution, um, I think we cannot use this as the underlying mechanism because uh, they won't be it won't be semantics preserving for stateful modules yes uh, th th there's a secondary aspect though um, I'm not sure Michael can you elaborate if all um, uh, loads of a graph um, have to finish before uh, any evaluation of any member of the graph can actually occur so this is a static um, a static um, binding related uh, artifact where if, if one of your modules is an error, as in it cannot be loaded, then the entire graph never evaluates. Is that behavior present here? Or will some code evaluate and then the graph interrupts midway because some fetch failed only after you evaluated a bit of your code? Uh, yes, and then this gets straight back to Mark's point, which is in Jesse, because we're evaluating only pure expressions, we have no user code executing besides the, the immunize call in this case or harden or whatever it is. But a uh, half executed program, uh, a volatile uh, broken state can have side effects that um, cannot be estimated. There are no side effects. These are side effects. Real, real life side effects. Like a program that never finishes has done something. That's something being uh, unpredictable and incomplete um, is the problem with that pattern. So if a file... There, there is no side effects of it. 
No, no, I mean, I mean, in real life, any program makes a side effect, and that, that's why the program... No, this program, the only side effects it can do is hardening the expressions that it itself makes. Okay, yes. so, sorry, sorry. You use Jesse code to execute something that has an effect, not a, not a code side effect inside the code, but I mean an effect on real life, like a transaction, yeah. an operation, something happens in the world, right? Um, uh, no, it's only evaluating expressions that are all pure. So there is no side effect except for the evaluation itself. Which... Thank you, X. Don't think code for a second. User experience wise, I use a program to do something. That's something not being complete. Um, and uh, it's, being... it's not started. If any of the imports fail, it's not even started. Is what right. I'm that, that's, that's guaranteed, right? Yeah, that's guaranteed. OK, that, that's what I was hitting at. Sorry about that. OK, thank you. So the only asynchronous things that's happening here is the fetch. The evaluation can only happen after all the fetches are complete. And uh, calling the evaluator here waits for all other fetches? All the fetches that it depends upon. Right? So the top level, which is the only thing that can actually execute any of the program, needs all of its sub-fetches and all of its sub-modules uh, okay, I see you have here promise.all, then, okay, factory lot of fly. That's good. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I missed that line. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. All right, thanks. So, one thing I was thinking about in order to um, have a translation for full SES uh, is, um, uh, first of all, uh, one of the restrictions uh, that uh, Michael is making uh, for Jesse, uh, you can think of it as a restriction imposed by the rewrite as a shim that would not be a restriction in the full Jesse language as specified is that this pattern of introduced variable names like dollar uh, h underbar define, um, if I understand correctly, you're basically reserving the namespace of all variable names named dollar identifier characters underbar identifier characters. Is that about right? Uh, just dollar underscore or just dollar h underscore. Those are all the hidden. Quote variables. Oh, oh, dollar H underscore. I see all of them are H. Yeah, all the hints. Okay. Um, uh, so, okay, good, good. And that um, can be changed arbitrarily too. Right, but, but and are you actually, did you actually modify the Jesse, uh, the Jessica, so that if any of those names appear in the user input, they get rejected? Yes. Great, great. So, uh, so first of all, I was thinking of just saying that a translator for ECMAScript modules that's part of an SES shim, I think can painlessly adopt exactly that same restriction. Um, uh, one, more, one more thing on that, sorry. Um, I, and I actually want to ask you, Mark, uh, do you know if all uh, JavaScript runtimes support uh, the um, 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 Unicode escape notation, um, like do all do all places where Jesse and um, and safe ECMAScript will be running, uh, do they all support Unicode um, escapes as part of variable declarations? Because I've I've gotten uh, to a point where uh, to avoid accidental things, I use um, combining um, graphemes or glyphs. Um, that are uh, considered valid ECMAScript identifiers. Um, you know, um, it just makes it that you wouldn't reasonably clash with a reasonably named variable. Uh, hence, uh, and, and as such, your restrictions would be some um, variable that includes invisible characters. Um, um, so, yes. I, so XS would be the wild card here. Uh, I don't know what XS accepts, but I know that XS makes very clear that in order to avoid 
requiring the Unicode tables be present in, in small memory devices, uh, that they uh, shed the parts of the language that can only be implemented with Unicode tables. Mm -hmm. Uh, and presumably, they, that means that they would also shed the part that classifies non-ASCII characters into identifier versus non-identifier characters, but I don't know. Uh, the other thing is that the representation of uh, ECMAScript strings is UTF-16. The uh, XS uses UTF-8. So, um, uh, so therefore, Anything about the encoding of ECMAScript that's specific to UTX-16, such as representing um, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the large characters, the characters that are bigger than 16 bits, uh, in ECMAScript, uh, you write them with their UTF-16 encoding as, as a pair of UTF-16 surrogate characters. Yeah. Uh, that's not in XS. Other than XS, I believe everybody does the full Unicode uh, spec as specified, including the use of escapes inside, inside variable names. So they don't handle zero-width joiners except as uh, surrogate pairs? OK. Now you've, you've, you've just gone beyond my knowledge of Unicode. I don't know what a zero-width joiner is or how it interacts with everything else. Okay. It's, it's, yeah, the zero width joiner, um, uh, I think, or, or non joiner in ECMAScript, I think is sometimes treated as a, a kind of like a white space character. Uh, but uh, but uh, let, let me maybe say um, the thing that was recently added to the JSON subset or from the JSON uh, subset, which is the paragraph and line separator. I'm just checking the numbers for those. Yeah, uh, uh, 2028 and 2029. So, so those are um, high, high bit. Um, no, they're not. 2028? 2028 um, 20, is uh, within um, the basic multilingual planes, within 16 bits. And it's not a surrogate character. Yeah, yeah, it's not. Uh, OK. Uh, I think the zero width joiner is not two then. OK. Yeah, it's the same range, or roughly the same age, or range. Yeah. OK. Um, uh, in any case, so uh, I know that in, in the SES, the old SES in Kaha, where I scanned the source text uh, for all identifier, for all, for all possible variable names, um, that I had logic to deal with Unicode escapes in variable names but I don't remember what that logic is. I remember that I, we had to think about it very carefully to know that it was safe. Um, uh, the, um, uh, so, okay. Uh, for the record, Jason uses UTF-8. No. What? Yeah. UTF-8 is defined in Jason standard. Chip? Sure. I, I think a lot of JSON parsers actually crash if it even Sorry, has a bomb. I was, I was muted. Um, yes, JSON is, the, the encoding is, is UTF-8. Oh, the encoding of the JSON source text. Yes. But when, when, when a JSON string wants to talk, uh, want, wants to use an escape sequence to, as an encoding of a Unicode character, let's say a Unicode character that's beyond the basic multilingual plane, what does JSON specify about how you write that in the source text of a string using escapes? Uh, backslash U four digits. That's what I thought. There is no it, there, there is no, um, uh, and the, I'm sorry, and you said four digits. So well, four hex digits, yeah. Four hex digits. So if what you're encoding is a character that's larger than 16 bits. Then it's, then it's however you would represent 
that in UTF 16, say, or however you want to represent it. I, I don't, I don't recall the particulars, but <clears throat> um, UTF-8 has, has, has a way of encoding uh, uh, double byte, I think. Yeah, double byte things. Um, it, it, it does, but my, so, so, so I think, I think that, that, yeah, I think I may have confused the conversation because uh, there's two very different concepts. There's what's the JSON source text itself written in. Right. And then there's how does the JSON source text write a literal string to represent yes. that, that would evaluate right. given right. you a string. So that escape is a literal string that avoids the pitfall of double byte encoding that is platform dependent sometimes and is not always uh, adhering. Um, and, and they literally encode the character, the slash, the U, and the four digits um, to tell the, uh, the um, uh, parser to consider this as an escape sequence that, that refers to a single character of uh, the particular UTF um, um, code, um, regardless of the fact that the source text is uh, UTF-8. Okay, and I, and I believe the second one is specifically UTF-16. Uh, I, I, no, I don't believe that is so. I believe that is entirely up to the, um, the encoder and the decoder. Oh, I think the right. parser is more is more is more where it is because the encoder and decoder uh, encode and decode the slash the u and the digits okay but the parser and the serializers are the ones that actually decide that since this is probably not utf8 predictably then i'm just going to make it an escape yeah okay i think we can return all the way back out of this Okay, I'm going to have to bail. I have a, another thing that I have to go to, unfortunately. Okay. Um, okay, we'll see you, Chip. All righty. Okay. So returning out of Unicode, I mean, clearly anything we're doing processing the source text has to make sure that we stay safe in the presence of allowed Unicode. Uh, one of the ways to say, stay safe is to just say that in the subset where that, that our shim accepts, we're just going to reject anything that we can't that we can't easily deal with safely. Um, uh, but uh, going back to the restrictions compared to the language we want to specify. So for Jessica, Michael is imposing the implementation restriction of dollar H underbar, which I'm perfectly happy to also accept into SES. Uh, in addition, I'm wondering. Have any of us ever seen any non-test code, any, any code whose purpose was to do something uh, that made use of live bindings in order to have the provider of a binding mutate it after exporting it? Uh, no, I think a clarification is uh, due uh, for that. But are, are we talking a module exports something and then that module changes its, uh, its let um, a declaration uh, assignment of that exported thing? Exactly. So, so I, let, I, I do that all the time. I'm sorry, say again? I do that all the time with ESM modules. People use that. People who write ES modules rely on, on the fact that a let a uh, variable uh, being exported is made as a let, not a const, because it will change. Could you show me an example? I, I, I rabbit hole, rabbit hole. Let's stay out of examples here. But I, like, I, I would export um, uh, a state, um, a status of my of my uh, module, for instance, um, and then um, that status changes. Uh, after some, some um, you know, um, whatever event that occurs, maybe a counter. So I can export a counter of how, how many times a function was called, and I update that counter. Wow. Uh, 
right? So, so that lead count um, is significant for debugging uh, behavior. Um, and I don't necessarily mind if other people can have read-only access to it. It's wow. a, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so my, 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 um, my plan just got killed on that. Um, I was planning to, I was, I was about to suggest that SES, uh, as implemented by the shim, uh, differ from SES as specified by rejecting any programs that have an assignment to an exported variable. And I was about to suggest that under the assumption that nobody actually does that in practice. Uh, and that's fair absolutely for, wrong. Yeah, it's fair for Jesse, because there are no side effects uh, right. in, the, in the module scope. So, so but it, it's not fair for SES if you expect it to interact with code uh, in the wild. Okay, I was yeah, I was I was okay. Uh, so that's unfortunate. Uh, and the only way to support live bindings in a packager without an invasive rewrite is by leveraging the with on a proxy trick, or at least leveraging the with trick. Uh, there is another way, uh, yeah. platform dependent, okay. uh, dynamically constructed modules. In Node.js, you can make a VM uh, module uh, although you do a lot of the plumbing work for linking. But, how, uh, but the problem is that the importing side, the module that imported the live binding, yeah. is referring to the live binding with a simple variable name reference, just a simple use of a variable name, foo. Yeah, no, like what I was trying to say is that my bundler experiment that pre preceded me doing the live bindings manually in, in a with, uh, in a with uh, proxy, um, that, that one used a pattern, initially data URLs in the browsers, and all I did was I did the re relinking against data URLs, which doesn't work for cyclic, but then I used um, the service worker, or in Node.js, I created virtual modules uh, using the VM module, and those were basically the source text of the, of the actual modules uh, executing as real modules, so my bundle said create virtual modules of all those modules and make them that they are real modules and link them to whatever they end up being uh, at runtime. When you so, say real modules, you're talking about real ECMAScript modules? Yes, that was my initial experiment. Okay. And with service workers, you could uh, inject module code um, as, uh, into a cache and return that when it's being fetched um, so you would do your linking by returning uh, a response with the module source, um, and, and that, that means when it's evaluated in the client, it's like the real module, but it, it came down as one, um, um, one uh, concatenated file, um, and um, the, the runtime behavior is 100% ESM, um, because it's 100% ESM. So, so you need some way to tell your loader, give me the module from a source text that is yeah. a string. Yeah, so, so, so the problem is that what I'm trying to achieve with the SES shim yeah. is that the shim does not depend on a just uh, on a user written JavaScript compiler being correct in order to assure uh, uh, in order to ensure that potentially malicious code is properly confined. Now it does rely obviously on a you know anytime you have a parser and a rewriter it does rely on the correctness of the parser and rewriter to preserve the meaning of code for which my security depends on my own code doing what I think it does, but to the extent that my, my security depends 
on your code not being given a, uh, access that it was not supposed to have, uh, what I call the, the offensive code problem as opposed to the defensive code problem. Uh, I want to do that without relying on being able to parse JavaScript accurately or rewrite JavaScript accurately. Yeah, and, and that, that was exactly what I was going for with the, with the initial idea. And uh, it was only because there was no predictable uh, similarity. I, I have a shim that allowed me to run the same code in Node and in, um, in the web browser. And it loaded modules um, from strings of the source text, i.e. I could have one file that is a bundle that says, in this uh, particular uh, entry point, the source text of the module is x. Um, and at runtime, what, what happened here is I just created a virtual module, which is, which is uh, parsed as if it's a real thing by, by the runtime, not by me. Um, and but, but, but the, 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 the module that's parsed by the runtime yes. might, if, assuming you do not have a accurate user level parser and you're handing module text that you can therefore not accurately um, examine ahead of time, you're yeah. handing it to the runtime execution engine, how do you prevent that module text from accessing, let's say in the browser, accessing the real document? Okay, so th those are, I think, separate uh, concerns. Um, so my bundle can add a little bit of, of uh, trust by saying that I'll get the bundle, but I already know what the S, you know, whatever, what, what the hash will be for the module that I'm going to be evaluating from this bundle. I have all the hashes. Um, and if the text appears not to match, then I'm going to say that this bundle is not trusted. So I can throw because the source seems not to reflect what it should have been. Okay, so in other words, if the code you've decided to trust accesses document um, and is actually uh, accesses document and you decided to trust it because you thought it wasn't uh, uh, or you know more generally you, the, the I mean this is basically only only workable for code that you've that pre-validated that you're willing to be fully vulnerable to well if you pre-validate code in order for you to get a hash Pre-validate how? Well, it, it, like the Tofu tool saves the sh, um, um, uh, like the the like um, I don't know what the word is. The hashing of the module source text is saved, and that says that eventually, when I get this source text um, in my runtime, I know what it should compute to, and if that source text changed from the point where where I said it was trustworthy. Let's say, the source, let's say the source text didn't change. How did you decide the source text was trustworthy? Well, initially, when I created the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the trust hashes of the source code, I did this um, in, in um, you know, not at runtime. I did this at the point of compiling this bundle. Um, and I saved those uh, hashes. At runtime, the runtime just has to know that the code is faithful to the point, you know, to what it was at the point where I could do a full analysis of it. Okay. So you assume you, so, so just to be explicit, I'm not saying this is an unreasonable assumption, but just to be explicit about what the assumption is, uh, you assumed that at build time, you had an accurate parser uh, that was giving you an accurate AST that you could exactly uh, that that was uh, that was faithful with regard to the meaning of the original source exactly that is one layer the second layer is in the experiment that I was screen sharing was if I create uh, proxies and use those proxies to enforce security but I wasn't enforcing security yet right I was just um, shimming the behavior of the module scope. Um, okay. But in that proxy, you could, um, you know, separate from the fact that your source is trusted or not uh, by deferring validation okay. to tooling. 
Okay, but 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 hold on. There's 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 something I'm not understanding here. Yeah. The the, the width on a proxy that width can only occur in sloppy code. The, you, you, the can nest, you, you can nest strict script code within exactly. sloppy code. Exactly. But you cannot nest an ECMAScript module within sloppy code. Well, um, I nest um, strict function. And aside from the fact that arguments, which is a top level, um, uh, it's an error to occur in the top level, um, aside from simulating that um, references to arguments uh, inside this eval um, would be an error, um, uh, the use strict on the function almost entirely, obviously without the export and import static declarations, um, it, it behaves like a module um, um, uh, scope, aside from bindings and, um, and, and, and the degree of separation from the global scope. Okay, so, so the bindings, that was the problem we were starting with. I was saying, yeah. um, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to represent live bindings right. while translating into an evaluable script. Yeah, and those are the rest of the modules I didn't get into in my, exp in my example. Okay, but, but, but just I want to verify that we, that we came to a mutual understanding here. Given that we're trying to be safe against code we have not parsed, uh, including, including modules we have not parsed, and we want to prevent them from having access we didn't authorize, uh, that if we're going to have a minimally invasive translation of those modules so that we can run them safely, um, uh, then there is no minimally invasive translation uh, where we get to run them directly as a module. We have the only the only translations are to run them as a script. Uh, um, uh, and um, uh, we have to run them because we have to run them inside a width. And now in order to emulate a live binding, uh, we have to use that width to do that emulation because the read-only access to the live binding is just a simple variable name that so, we do not want to rewrite. So it's a really good way you distilled it, but here, you know, all of a sudden, I'm uh, reminded of a year ago when I joined the modules team that I was the only one fighting to ensure that you can create a virtual module from source text and have it act as if it, it comes from a particular path on your, in your module map. I wanted, just as I could use the caches and service worker to actually execute my unbundled modules from a concatenated string, um, as in I put them in the cache and I let them import as if they are full-fledged URLs. Um, um, it, the client is unaware from the fact that it came from a string. That, that, that was a possible case in the browser. And I was a year ago, and I still am until now, fighting uh, to ensure that there will always be a way to do this in Node. So, so yes, uh, without having real full-fledged ESM virtual modules, um, browsers have them. Node should have them if things go as planned. Um, but without them, Yes, there is definitely no way you can evaluate ESM modules um, 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 as first class um, uh, code. OK. OK. Does that? Um, does it help or? Um, I mean, I think, I think that I mean, <laughs> we, we could, uh, you know, my experiment was for me to learn more about bindings. 
but if you'd like, we can we can clean up my experiment a bit. I, if you want me to do that, uh, um, and just show that if you use with and you do bind things by actually binding, um, you know, um, I, I I simply use an arrow function to define a binding from a scope. That's my getter. Um, And it, it honors all the hoisting requirements of ESM. Okay, so um, so here's the thing that I was hoping for, which I think I now understand. I cannot have, which is, I was thinking that all of the modules that are conceptually executing within the same compartment could be packaged like Michael's packaging, where the entire thing was one evaluable string, where each module within that evaluable string was a separate function, rather than having e the, each module itself be a separate evaluable string. Uh, because because if, since the, since um, uh, with regard to the, to the, like the fact that each module gets a different require if you're trying to do um, uh, comma JS modules, for example, just, just an example, uh, that was okay because the packaging of the module inside a wrapped function uh, as we've actually seen in Node itself, could just have there be a require parameter in that wrapping function, and that would give each module its own unique binding of require. Um, uh, the um, uh, the AMD-like rewrite that Michael showed gives uh, each module its own set of um, uh, import of imports because they turn into function parameters. But in order to give each module its own set of bound live bindings, which the text inside the function body can use simply by using a variable name, I would have to make, I would have to have the packaging have each module uh, be represented in the packaging as a separate literal string that has to be separately evaluated at runtime. That, that is, that is uh, definitely aligning with um, everything I've experienced in that um, domain. Wow. So one question that I would have is, what is wrong with rewriting the body, bodies of these AMD-like functions so that when they specify one of these bound names, it's just a reference through the module object? So, right. Um, you don't get them right. The, yeah. There's only that, I, I was trying to avoid the pain of a more invasive rewrite, but now that we've seen, seen that the pain of avoiding the rewrite is quite high, uh, I'm willing to um, uh, consider so, more invasive rewrites. And I think saying that every, every use occurrence of an important name gets rewritten this, this might be the right thing to do here. Um, it's not necessarily, by the way, because, um, I mean, to get to the point where you discover that it becomes problematic, you get too far invested in. But I, I'm going to ask a devil's advocate question. Okay. Um, has the, the consistent conclusion of all, all bundlers uh, not... Um, clearly show that there was always an oversight or an undersight, whatever the right term is here, on, on some edge case that, uh, that is compounded um, in specialized code, like SES being you know, allergic to bundlers. Uh, it's not like people write that style of code every day. Um, so I'm just going to say that if you write a bundler that handles SES edge cases, and people use it with cases that are not edge cases for normal bind, uh, bundlers, 
you will end up with someone who is really getting a bad day every day. Well, it depends how much additional pain we're imposing for the edge cases. And what I was hoping for is something that correct. I mean, in general, what we're trying, what we try to achieve uh, is something that remains correct on the edge cases uh, without imposing significant extra expense for the normal cases. And usually we achieve that. Um, um, well, I, I, what I'd like to add is that um, in, this, in this particular case of importing live bindings, we have one rule, which is the import can only be at the module level scope. So it needs to be at the module level, which is all your proxy is doing is intercepting things that hit the module level. Well, and the import can only be a pure name. It cannot be anything that's a data structure or function bound or otherwise. I, I'm 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 a hundred percent with with you guys that it's possible to do the rewrite and it's a valid um, uh, exercise that it has a lot of merit. But I, I think what I what I haven't said so far is that I've been I've been keen on this idea of reflective modules like reflect dot um, dot uh, you know create module like this is what what the pop culture says it is. Um, I think that ECMAScript Sorry, did, not did not understand that. So, so we have an eval that we use to evaluate code. And now we have modules. We should have a way to evaluate source text modules as a first class, um, 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 you know, um, something that I can do. Like I can write in my code, new module, here's the URL and here's the source text, and it should actually become um, a, a real module in the module map. Doing it the right way, though, I'm, I'm very sloppy in how I'm dis discussing this, but all the headache of bundling existed for a language that did not have a module format. That makes sense. But since now there is a module format, a bundler should use the facilities of the module format of that nat you know, native to that language to create the modules virtually. And the spec has been, I don't know, the, re the causes or reasons, um, has been uh, kind of saying that you cannot um, dynamically instantiate a module um, and, and they stay, say security and all these other you know, good reasons why not to have it. But you can import from data URL, um, which effectively creates a module from a string um, and you, you could um, not eval an import statement from a data URL, but you could use a service worker to create a dynamic module. So dynamic modules not requiring um, a service worker um, um, is maybe something that the spec should look into safely. Um, there are a lot of hazards in using code to create a module in the module map. So I'm just putting it on the table that I came to the conclusion that this is something the language needs. Um, rewriting is not necessarily going to prove problematic um, until it does and, and, and it has already every single time with bundlers. Okay, so, um, so let's see if we can anticipate what the problem would be if we rewrote use occurrences of variables into property accesses of uh, the corresponding property name on the uh, module exports object. You've already eliminated the, you've already put a restriction on at least one variable not being uh, allowed in your um, um, module text. That object from which you're accessing property names, um, assume it's called module or uh, module scope, that word, that, that identifier has become a reserved identifier in any bundled code. Right, but, but, but uh, let's assume that I've already accepted the uh, Jessica restriction that all variable names beginning with dollar $h underbar are reserved. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, is, there, is there still an additional problem that I'm introducing here? Somehow, um, a, this reference returning the exports object uh, where it is not expected. And, and that becomes, uh, you can reflectively inspect something that does not exist in the original code. So you're going to have to simulate some type of, uh, you cannot do that. That's why ESM, the uh, uh, um, J Dalton, um, uh, ESM in Node, uh, that's why it instruments um, variables for every single module scope uh, so that it can throw an error when you try to access a variable that exists in a module scope that is not the module scope where it is being evaluated directly somehow. So, so you, you will have to somehow make sure that if at any point H exports is being uh, inspected, then um, that's probably an, a side effect of bundling because it can never be inspected if it didn't exist when the code was written. So, so in the case, it sounds like the, the particular prohibition that uh, ESM is trying to do there is because they're merging scopes across multiple original module texts. Uh, whereas the really nice thing about the AMD pattern uh, is that um, uh, every module source text executes in a different scope. They have, you have essentially the same scope separation between modules as bundled as you had originally. Yes, but, but the, the case, the, uh, I think the reason why uh, you end up with um, with additional instrumentation is not because your, your design um, w uh, anticipated uh, leakage of, of uh, a variable in a place where it shouldn't be, so you need to. No, I think what happens is when a user reports an edge case, you start to put in guards, and those guards keep growing. Could you show me an example of a guard? Uh, no, like I, I'm, I'm talking very hypothetical. Um, but I, I know for a fact that ESM uh, instrumented when people said there were uh, un unexpected behaviors. So, so it was after the initial design that they, after the fact that they had to actually introduce ways to handle edge cases. Could you, could you give, could, could you um, uh, give it, I mean, I'm not, if, you can't, if you can't find it to show on the screen, that's fine. But could you give an example, at least verbally, of uh, one of these concrete edge cases that ESM solved? Uh, I, I think it would be better if I can get um, uh, uh, JD uh, to actually join okay. us in a meeting and run yeah. us through why he had to instrument. OK, good. good. Yeah. He had joined us before. It would be very good for him to join us for this. Yeah, so, uh, you know, like, um, I'm not sure if, uh, I think he's on vacation. Uh, he hasn't been attending the modules meetings, but as yeah. soon as he's back, um, because, you know, we, we kind of uh, swapped notes a bit when I was doing my modules experiments. Um, and and um, definitely there is a lot of um, um, making sure people get the right, um, um, you know, what they expect. If it's an error they expect, the error shouldn't make sense. Um, so, so uh, but again, if we're gonna talk about H uh, exports not being allowed in the source text, then uh, it should never be allowed to hit an eval. It cannot be in a string that hits any eval anywhere in, in code. Okay, so, so actually, so the case that Kate was mentioning before uh, actually does, explain why the rewrite we were just talking about would be unpleasantly in invasive. Let's say yeah. that there's a lexical reference to the variable foo that's inside a module where foo was imported as a live binding from another module. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this use occurrence of foo is inside a function where we then elsewhere use function prototype to string to 
get the string applied form of that function in order to send that string elsewhere to be evaluated. Yeah. The, re the rewrite, uh, we know that rewriting import and export can't corrupt that case because they can never occur inside a function. Um, yeah. uh, however, rewriting usage occurrences of variables can and does appear inside function bodies. Uh, and rewriting that means that when you then evaluate the function elsewhere, the rewrite of the use occurrence of the variable uh, now disrupts its meaning. If you, if you, you, should, you should have, if you, if you said foo inside the function, you should have been able to evaluate that function source text elsewhere if you were providing it with a binding for foo, uh, and now that won't mean what you thought it meant. Yeah, that's a good point. So, so that's what I tried to preserve with, um, with my module experiment. It's, I, I actually called it ESX, and I was going to um, you know, make my next big package that I never finished. Um, and, and tell people that uh, we needed module formats other than ESM um, before ESM. Uh, this is the first module format that actually comes after ESM. Uh, and the idea was that it would translate your code to retain the semantics and use the exact shim um, and, and, and do bindings so that you don't end up exactly with this kind of um, um, uh, if you rewrite the code, then evaluating it elsewhere uh, as ESX should work the same way. That, that was the goal. Um, so you're do, are you doing that by doing the with on a proxy strict, strict, uh, uh, trick yes. per source module text? Yes, and I used rollup to bundle my, my module runtime, <laughs> and I got it to work identically in Node as ESM, and as rollup ESM, and as rollup CommonJS, and as rollup IFI, and as rollup UMD. So I basically transpiled ESM, um, theoretically. Obviously, it's, it's fake ESM that looks like ESM, into um, a module loader that it itself has been bundled as all module formats and preserved, retained its behavior, uh, regardless of which bundling method was used. Um, and in the browser and in Node. Okay. But obviously, a lot of work goes to making this actually a workable thing. Like, all I did was prove to myself that it's possible. Um, Michael, uh, in, in your um, uh, 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 packager uh, bundle, whatever you want to call it, sure. um, you're just examining each individual module source text independently. Um, you're not doing any intermodule analysis in order to, the, the translation does not depend on inter, any intermodule analysis? That's correct. Uh, uh, Sala, is that the same for you? Um, yeah, I, I, um, the live uh, binding um, naturally does, and, and I still have you know uh, a lot of work on that part. But but the compiler, um, i.e., given a source text, give me a function that will evaluate the module, uh, has has no clue um, what imports um, mean. Um, it's it's clueless. It just knows that those variables will be in it in the scope, um, um, given the wiring that will happen. Okay. Um, I think I got a lot. I, I, I hope everybody else did. I certainly got a lot out of this. I feel like I know what I need to do to proceed from here. And it's extremely different than what I thought it would be. Um, I'm in order, I'm, 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 my plan now is to proceed by uh, um, having the bundler represent uh, each module source text as a separate translated literal string that is, that, that is um, intended to be executed from within the with on a proxy. Um, uh, 
uh, so that the so that in the absence of better information, all of the imported variables are provided by the proxy so that they can be live. And, but, and doing that also gives me everything I need in order to deal with cycles. Um, uh, and this is a much more expensive bundling than I was hoping for, but I can preserve all the semantics that um, and uh, that normal SES has, uh, with the only exception that I can that I can see being the dollar H underbar. I, don't, I think that this scheme doesn't need to introduce any other deviations from SES as we want to specify it. So so um, um, dollar H underbar. I'm sorry, just to clarify here, if you are using a with proxy then um, dollar each under bar is not going to be, uh, oh, it's your exports thing, right? It's the thing you export against? Yeah, the, 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 um, uh, the dollar H under bar would be uh, lexical variables inserted into the translation in order, uh, into the translation of import and export. So for example, if I was importing, uh, um, uh, you know, import open curly foo comma bar close curly from um, uh, a specifier string. Uh, that that source text does not name the exports object that I got from that module. Um, uh, I would still, you know, Michael's translation uh, does name that exports object because um, it doesn't. In that case, it doesn't need to because it could just do the destructuring in the function head. Yeah, I like decide to do that. Um, so, so, but but there's there is a thing here though. Um, it, we're we're used to the module dot exports pattern of common JS being an object for which if I put something on it, it becomes an export. But if you're if you're semantically uh, mimicking uh, ESM. Then yeah. your exports should not be a thing that you can address. It should be a thing that uh, expects you to call on. Um, right, 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 right. No, you're you're completely right. In order to emulate ESM, okay. So let me let me let me talk this out. Yeah. Um, uh, this is based on. Um, this is inspired by. Just to make sure, make make clear that it's not trying to be uh, uh, literally based on. Uh, inspired by the JavaScript API for a WASM module. Um, so uh, the translation of an ECMAScript module into, um, okay, since I have to have a separate string per thing, uh, I might as well just um, uh, uh, translate the module separately. Um, uh, and uh, then the packaging is basically just concatenating together those separate packagings. So uh, each ECMAScript module would be translated into a, an object literal, one of whose members was, let's say, SRC, uh, whose value was the translated source, uh, and then the other members of that object literal are a static description of the linkage information so that a loader could have uh, direct access to a simple representation of the linkage information. And that would be both a static representation of um, uh, what is imported as well as what is exported. Uh, and then the what the linker would do with that is um, linking a set of modules together would really turn into creating a set of proxies whose name lookup where, where each proxy was going to be the proxy for a different one of these modules. Um, uh, with a you know, separate width per module, uh, hooking up the proxies 
so that the name lookups, the, 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 the name lookup on one uh, turned into uh, access to the uh, name as exported by another one. That was probably uh, unclear. Let me try. Let me try a concrete example. Um, uh, module A exports live binding foo. Module B imports live binding foo. In both cases, under the variable name foo. Uh, the uh, uh, both of, well, yeah, let, let's just take this example, even though maybe it's a little bit too simple. Um, uh, there is a separate proxy made for A and made for B. The proxy made for A honors both a get and a set to the name foo uh, by upgrade, by, by, by updating some internally maintained state that's the current value of foo. Um, the proxy for B would also honor a get on the name foo, uh, but not a set on the name foo. Mm -hmm. And when there was a get on the name foo, uh, the, proxy, the, the proxy for B would know to consult the A state maintained by the proxy for A uh, in order to provide the current value for foo. Um, with, that, with those, that, sorry? That complicates it a little bit. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's semantically correct. Okay. Um, so so I, I found that bindings are literally an arrow function that you create in the scope. Um, so I pass that as the getter that gets installed on the particular proxy of the importer for whatever name that importer is. It will import this G1, and that getter is the one function that actually becomes the actual getter across the modules. Um, when, I, when I export an alias, um, I just, you know, I, I, I use the two string method to see the first identifier that occurs in this exporter, um, that tells me what the exported name is. Um, and calling that function as the getter that is installed on the, on the namespace object or okay. getter that is, uh, that is wired into the scope of the module okay. uh, always results in the right value bound from the right scope. OK. OK. Let me, let me, let me um... I like the idea of using a getter. The getter is a function that you would evaluate within the scope of the that with on the proxy set up. Yes. Uh, the, that scope, wait a second, there's, there's a circularity problem. I don't know how to break there. Um, if the getter is evaluated in the scope, then... It's not evaluated in the scope. The getter is, is uh, the function is, 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 is um, the expression, the error expression uh, refers to the variable uh, being exported. It is being defined at some point in the same scope, but as soon as, as the export is done, and I'm using a generator here, um, and because theoretically I could, uh, for cyclical, I would just say yield exports. Um, once that reference to the variable occurs, um, the semantics of the variable being referred to before it's actually uh, initiate, instantiated um, is, um, is not related um, to um, the binding. Um, it's related to the, the evaluation order of things. That's all. Um, so, so what I'm trying to say is I'm going to always um, export the getter, but I'm going to make sure that my, my module loader puts things in the right order to uh, adhere to the ECMAScript uh, behaviors of uninitialized um, references to bindings. 
So cir circularity is solved by loading modules in the right order. Eva loading them and then evaluating them in the right order that, that retains uh, the hoisting um, uh, and uh, non-hoisting behaviors of uh, bindings. Does that? So I'm still, I am still don't understand the arrow function, which is the getter. Mm -hmm. where, where is this, where is that evaluated? What scope is that evaluated in? Well, uh, assume a module exported something. Like here I have imports and those are how I uh, escape my imports and, and keep them in the source of my text for reference. Uh, so since this is a function, when this module is, the evaluator of this module is being um, created, this, this text we see all, you know, here, um, it basically- uh, I'm sorry, hold, hold on, stop. Is this the output or the input? This is the runtime um, uh, synthesized evaluator of the module itself. It okay. expects the module object as the first argument and the exports, which is a function, uh, with one uh, with one um, um, dynamic property called default, uh, it uses getters. The, the imports here are just string literal expressions, just like use strict are. So they have no effect, correct? Yeah, because they had they, those are a separate mechanism. Those are bound against the module dot scope. Okay, so they're included here really just as documentation. Yes, yes. So, um, and because I didn't do the, uh, the uh, source text parsing, that was a separate experiment altogether. I literally avoided having to uh, work on source text by escaping them like that in my source just for, for not laziness, but for lack of wasting time on this aspect. So the fact that the module was constructed uh, regard, irrespective of the fact that they are a string initially in the module, but they, they just hinted to the module constructor to resolve this specifier and to make sure that there's a variable in the scope called exactly that. Um, and that variable um, is uh, initialized by a getter that looks something like that from that result scope when it evaluates. So let's see what direct exports does. Okay, this is the direct imports. I've, I've done some manual rewrites to try to make it, um, le uh, you know, less, less uh, invasive. Um, but here I'm retaining the original semantics of the, of the, evalu of the compiled evaluator. Um, for this to export, it's using the exports helper and giving it um, arrow functions. Let's just say the arrow function has two, two functions, two, two um, um, uh, uh, um, effects here. The first thing, it gives the binding getter, and it also identifies that the exported name will be Q, because the first identifier in the source text of the arrow function is Q. Okay, so, so right now looking at this, where is Q defined? Q is actually defined in the same scope as a var. Ah, 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 ah. Okay, got it. But I, I make sure that the exports, here since it's inside the function body and exports is literally a function call, then I'm synchronously uh, making sure that my export definitions happen on the module namespace before the module code ever executes. So the export function that you're calling, yes, uh, that is specific to this module. Y yeah, the exports is a specific uh, handler that takes literally arrow functions. That's the only parameters it will accept. Okay, and the uh, and the reason why it can be positional is this specific exports already knows has already decided what variable name to associate with each of those positions. It actually uh, converts this to a string and looks for the first identifier. If I want to export something as, I just change the parentheses with the as part. So when I write the, you know, the exports are here uh, in, in this string. It's a little bit ugly to see. 
the, all of my exports here are one-to-one. -one. There aren't any as um, renames. Okay. But let's see one that has an um, as. I'm sure I have one of those. Huh, I have an exercise, something I, I cleverly solved. That's weird. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I usually like to solve a problem so I can play with it, but I didn't. So, no, this doesn't export. Indirect exports, maybe? Ah, here we go. So, export G1 as, and again, I didn't, no, this is not right. Ah, this one. Uh, sorry, it has an export. Yeah, so here it says export G2 as dollar okay. sign G2. Good, good. So the exporter rewrites that into an arrow function that looks like this. And ah. what it does is it looks for the first match of a valid identifier, um, knowing that it writes the, uh, the actual binder um, expression based on something, right? So, so you don't need any, any kind of management of details that, can, that the function provides. The function provides the binder, and it tells you if it's a rewrite, uh, an export as versus an export. OK. Uh, I think I got it. Um, uh, it is uh, 306. Uh, I think this is an excellent starting point. I actually feel like I know how to proceed well enough that I can make some progress before I get into trouble. Uh, I have no doubt I will get into trouble before I succeed. Uh, but I feel like I know where to start now, so that's great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just had a quick question before we break. Yeah. Um, is there going to be an, uh, an NPM release of SES05? Uh, uh, yes, there is already. There is, OK. I haven't seen it. How do I upgrade? <laughs> Just npm upgrade SES? Uh, yeah, or um, I think that's right. Or is it npm npm install might automatically do an update? Uh, uh, Michael, can you try the experiment right here while we have Kate online? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll just show this up. That did it. npm install SES at five point zero. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll take your word for it. No need to share your screen. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, yeah. Um, so we're on Thursday next week, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I did have the one question, and I just don't know what to do about it. I have two calendar listings. Does anybody have that as well? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. The reason is that um, I moved the t the Tuesday one to Thursday. I want to. Cons uh, I need to consolidate them right now. They have. Uh, overlap, largely overlapping uh, into, t into T lists. Uh, so I need to consolidate that. Um, the one, the, the thing that used to be on Tuesday is owned by me. Um, uh, so I, uh, the thing that used to be, that well, continues to be Thursday, that was on Thursday is owned by Kariti. So I need to coordinate with Kariti to consolidate those to one calendar entry. So sorry about that. No, no, no. Like I, I just thought that maybe I uh, did not do something right, and no. as, long, as long as everybody else is struggling, I'm yeah. happy. <laughs> yeah, it's me who did not do something right. Uh, hey, Michael, before you sign off, I was just wondering: is there a notification mechanism for like new releases of CES that you would find helpful? Like, if there was a uh, like a newsletter list or something that we could publish to. I don't know what, what would be noise and what would be helpful. Uh, absolutely. I think SES strategy is a good starting point. And then if sure. you want to add public ones from there, that'd be great. OK. Yeah, okay. SES strategy seems like a, a great place to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe, maybe when you're running an app with SES, um, have you guys considered the idea that the app would um, notify if there are new releases, like um, like, can you explain further? Like for Yarn, when there is a new release, because Yarn Yarn releases were going unnoticed, mm -hmm. Yarn actually lets you know that Yarn now has an update. If you want to install right. that, 
And, and, and they don't do it in an invasive way. It's not like every time you run, run yarn, it's going to keep bugging you until you update. So, but how do they let you know? Uh, on the command line, they just say, oh, by the way, you know, don't forget there's an update and you can run this command right here and it will give you the update. They must do some pull. They, I mean, they must uh, ask some server if there's been an update, right? I mean, uh, yeah, obviously that that's going to be the concern uh, there. There there will be um, a call that has that is being made. Um, right. So so maybe npm. Wait. Uh, so just I just wanted. So that means that Yarn can gather can can basically know each time any of their users run Yarn. I, I think it's a given. Okay. Um, with with package managers, I think they like to get as much statistics as possible. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, and you know, um, yeah. So so, but but I, I'm not sure if a package should have that authority as well. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. One of the things just I just got to insert a little historical note here. Uh, back when we were doing Xanadu before the web, we considered it to be an absolute constraint on the design that nobody could tell what documents you were reading. Uh, that was a hard, that was you know, a difficult requirement to meet. I'm not saying we knew how to meet it, but we considered it an absolute requirement. And the current web where the, the site serving the document you're reading can not only know what documents you're reading, but can know where you've scrolled to and how you're moving your mouse over it. It just astonishes me that people are willing to read under those conditions. Yeah, well, they made a haystack that is literally haystacks of haystacks. So tracking me by knowing a detail about all the million details they want to know about me is not going to make a difference in my life. Yeah. <laughs> Information overload is never a good strategy for tracking. And that's what they end up with. Mm -hmm. Too much about too unimportant things, too many unimportant things. The fact that they are potentially no vast amounts of, of about me is not, I think, a very good way to spend my privacy. Um, <laughs> what privacy? <laughs> right, what privacy, exactly. But uh, like, just a historic note, the world went in a very different direction than what we were imagining. Yeah, yeah. The illusion of privacy. All right. Okay, so I stopping recording. Yeah, uh, one last point after the recording stops.